So now we get to my reply, my initial reply letter to him. And I thought I'd be nice here, so I didn't call him a bunch of names. King James Video Ministries, there's our ministry address, January 19th, 2015. Dear Pastor Kelly, I was recently sent a copy of your booklet, Inspiration, Fundamentalism, in your Bible. I do have a few questions about what you have written, which I would appreciate if you would please take some time to clarify for me. Let me move this out of the way. I noticed on multiple pages that you write the statement, His inspired word and words. What exactly is meant by this? It is my understanding that the capitalized word of God is always a reference to the manifest word of God in the person of Jesus Christ. There are only seven references to this manifest word in the King James Bible. These include John 1, 1, three times, John 1, 14, 1 John 1, 1, 1 John 5, 7, and Revelation 19, 13. All other references to the word, lowercase w, are, are referring to either written or spoken words. So by your statement, are you saying that God inspired Jesus Christ as the manifest word? <laughs> little sarcasm there. It gets worse uh, as far as my sarcasm. On page two, you state God's word, which we can hold in our hands today, is inspired. Are you saying that we can hold Jesus Christ in our hands? Page two and three have the statement that we might disagree on Bible translations. Then on page 3, you even mention the American Standard Version or some other Bible version. By these statements, are you saying that fundamental Bible-believing Christians can use different translations and still come to the same belief in inspiration? I also need to point out your written statement on page 3, have the words that God originally gave, and then in the next sentence you refer to God's Word is preserved. Are you referring to the same written words of God or to Jesus Christ? On page 4, you wrote, Regardless of what position one holds regarding the family of manuscripts, we, might, we must agree as Bible-believing fundamentalists that God's word is still true. Are you saying that someone holding to the Nesalalan Greek is holding the same inspired scriptures as someone holding to the Textus Receptus? And again, we see the capitaliz capitalization of word. Then in the next sentence, you again write that God has preserved his word and words. What is meant by this? Page 5 has this statement or has thus statement, God's word is still inspired and without error in the Bible translation we hold in our hand and use today. Are you saying by this that inspiration is determined by personal preference and not by manuscript evidence? And that's exactly what he believes. He's going to deny it, but that's what he believes. You write about God's promise found in 1 Peter 1, 24 through 25 on page 6, and again you capitalize the W in word, even though the KJV says no such thing. Why? I showed you that in just a little bit earlier here. Page 7 has this statement, No matter what side of this issue one falls regarding manuscripts and translations, as fundamentalists we must avow that we do possess God's word and words. So then the issue of scriptural authority lies in personal preferences. And that's exactly what he believes. On page 13 you wrote 1 Thessalonians 2.13 where both references to the Word of God are both spelled with a lowercase w, but in the paragraph right above the verse you refer to God's Word with a capital W. Is this intentional deception or ignorance on your part? On page 17 in the final paragraph you state that we should stop calling fellow fundamentalists heretics and apostates. Again, are you saying that a man who is radically opposed to the King James Bible is not guilty of heresy and apostasy? Then on page 18, you mention Sinaiticus Vaticanus Alexandrian manuscripts and that we should all come to the same conclusion as fundamentalists. How can, we, when, how can we, when the Alexandrian manuscripts differ from the Receptus in thousands of places? Again, it appears to me as though your standard for inspiration is personal preference. There are many other issues which I believe are very misleading, but my main issue with your booklet is the confusing use of Word of God and Word of God as somehow being the same thing. In fact, the entire booklet seems to be a clever way of reinventing the Bible version issue to look like you are standing for inspiration of translation while, ta while taking no stand for any specific translation. How can this standard of personal preference be considered fundamental? Thank you for your time. I look forward to your reply in Christ Jesus. And of course, this isn't the one that I sent, so I don't have it signed. Okay, this is just a copy of what I sent. Okay, so just readjusting my watch. Okay. So there is my reply to his stupid booklet. Now we'll get his letter back to me. This one I might have to skip some of it. I'll just let you page down through it here because it gets, you know, it's seven pages long. Um, trying to keep this thing at least fairly short so you don't have to sit there for hours reading this. But 
we'll go through it here. Uh, see if I can get through this thing. Uh, greetings, Brian. Let me clarify some things about the booklet. You seem to have read some thing, things into the study and missed the main reason why I've written this simple booklet, which is to remember that the specific words of Scripture are inspired not just the concepts and teachings of the Bible. It was also written to silence the myth that only originals were inspired and that verbal inspiration, that which pertains to words, was not passed on through the manuscripts and to the and into the very Bibles that we have today. This booklet was not written to specifically undermine all the departures of the critical text, but to remind all fundamentalists that historic fundamentalism has always believed in verbal inspiration, the words that the Bible they have used was also verbally inspired, and that to deny this is nothing less than old line liberalism. He just, he goes through this letter here, and he repeats basically the same junk that he said in there, that I already refuted with my letter. The Dean Bergen Oath is a good one. The Bible is none other than the voice of him that sitteth upon the throne. Every book of it, every chapter of it, every verse of it, every word of it, every syllable of it, every letter of it, it is the direct utterance of the Most High. The Bible is none other than the Word of God. Not some part of it more, some part of it less, but all alike, the utterance of him who sitteth upon the throne, faultless, unerring, supreme, amen. You know, which one? Brian, if you want my full and in-depth study on the King James Bible and manuscripts, you will find it at our church website under the name King James Version. It goes into great detail on the history of the received text and lambasts the critical text for obvious reasons for, of deletions and departures from the church text. Please visit this site. Uh, there are many charts and graphs. Okay, Now, if you take such a strong stand for the King James Bible, why doesn't it show up here? Why do you mention the other versions and say it's okay to use the other versions as long as you believe in inspiration and preservation of those? Because he's a liar. There is a reason for emphasizing the capital W word in capital letters. Of course, you should know that this booklet has nothing to do about Jesus Christ as the living word, logos for the divine exegesis of God's eternal existence, John 1.1. 1, 1. I did not capitalize the word forgetting about the Logos of God, Jesus Christ. I did not write this booklet out of ignorance, as you suggested, or to be deceiving in any way. Yes, you did. There's not a hidden conspiracy going on behind every independent fundamental King James Version or Bible church. Uh, I didn't say that there was. We'll see that, about that later. The larger study on the King James Version clearly and overwhelmingly reveals that I, have followed, that I follow the received text and embrace it wholeheartedly. Which he doesn't. He, ref he follows the uh, majority text, which I confronted on him on years ago. You will notice that I did not capitalize the word where I quoted from the Bible, since our King James Bible does not capitalize it. The reason for the capitalization is for emphasis and respect for God's word and the, and the scriptures. Whenever I write, I always find myself capitalizing this important word, making it word, as do many others in their writings. Why do some capitalize the word Trinity, Rapture, Millennium, Heaven, Gospel, or Second Coming? Uh, or him when re referencing Jesus Christ. It's for the purposes of emphasis and reverence, not to be dis misleading or deceptive in any way. By the way, you should know that the earlier Greek New Testament uh, was written in all capital letters called unseals without spaces, punctuations, and accents. This, the Greek minuscule letters were written later, later and were in lower case. The Byzantine text type has by far the largest number of surviving manuscripts which were written in the minuscule lowercase style Erasmus and Tyndale used this type of Greek lower case. Out of respect for certain words, the King James translators capitalized words like Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, and God. Why can't we do this when we write about the Word of God? There is no underlying scheme or plot in respecting the Word by emphasizing it through capitalization. Well, first of all, his book here was not about Greek manuscripts and differences between the, um, the minuscule and the majuscule you know, types of readings and stuff like this. It wasn't about Greek. It was about English translations. That's why I made a point about it. And I'm going to answer that in my next letter to him. Uh, okay, you seem to suggest that the King James translators did not capitalize the word in 1 Peter 1, 24 through 25 and other places, and therefore it is heretical to capitalize it outside our respected and beloved King James Bible. Really? Remember that Tyndale and the translators chose not to or to not capitalize it, but the English came from all Greek lowercase, and it was their decision to not capitalize it while deciding to capitalize other words. Therefore, it is not a her heresy to keep it in a lowercase or capitalize it unless you believe that the Elizabethan English, look at that, itself is inspired. Capitalizing God's truth, the word, in our everyday writing is not misleading in any way, and yes, the word of God 
and Word of God are one and the same in spite of your dogmatic insistence that they cannot be the same, how could they not be the same? Oh, well, by the standards of the King James Bible, that only gives you seven references to a capital Word of God being Jesus Christ. It's not my dogmatic you know, insistence here. It's the standard of the King James Bible. I mean, if you read through the King James Bible, look at the context. It's obviously the, the references to the capital Word of God are all references to Jesus Christ. They are not references to the written Word. The King James Bible is my standard. That's why I go with that. In, is capitalizing the word in our modern English language while writing a paper a heretical conspiracy and attempt to move away from the King James Bible that we love and cherish? Absolutely not. If this were the case, then the tra KJV translators committed heresy when capitalizing the word spirit for the Holy Spirit, the word God for God, and the word Jesus for Jesus. Did William Tyndale commit heresy for not capitalizing the word a reference to Jesus Christ in John 1.1 1, 1 in his Bible? The K KJV translators relied heavily on William Tyndale's Bible, but they chose to make some capitalization changes. That Tyndale did not. The capitalization marks of Tyndale or the King James translators were not inspired, but the words from the received text were inspired. Okay, uh, and again, you have to make, when you do a proper translation, like the King James translators did, you make a difference between, I mean, if, if, if you wrote my name on a letter or whatever, you know, let me just show this, you know, that's what we do in the English language, okay? This is a standard of the English language. You capitalize somebody's name, the first letter, okay? So when Jesus Christ is referred to as the Word of God, and clearly you can see it in the context, you capitalize the W. That's just good English. If Tyndale did not do that, then he was an error in that point, and it should have been capitalized. That's a standard rule of the English language. That's the issue here. What is meant by distinction between the word, a capitalization of a proper name or subject, a common rule in the English language? You know, I'm, I'm not going to read this because it, it's just, it's getting to the point of just ridiculous here. You can read it there yourself. Uh, I'll just skip down here. Again, the purpose of, for writing this booklet is that some are making the claim that inspiration only extends to the autographs, but not to preservation, which would include Bible translations and the words that we find in them today. If this were the case, then we have nothing to stand upon. We would agree that there are some serious deletions and departures from the received majority text. It's not the same thing. Uh, that is presented in, represented in modern Bible versions. However, there are also many similarities. By this I mean that not every word or all the words in other Bible translations disrespects the findings of the received text. Therefore, any person who uses another Bible translation can still believe in the inspiration of their Bible and not be labeled a heretic regarding what they believe about the Bible and great doctrines of the Bible. Of course, this does not mean I agree with their Bibles in every place. Uh-oh. Let's see the little scholarly loophole, say there. I don't agree with them in every place. But in some places you're going to see later in the last letter that he does agree with them. Something else. I would disagree with them in many places. However, there are many other Christians who use other Bible translations who have not denied the faith, even though they have Bibles that do not accurately reflect the received or majority text in every instance. I, I addressed this in one of the FAQs. You know, uh, can you be a Bible-believing Christian? Are you really truly saved? And you know, can you hate the King James Bible and truly be saved? And I don't believe that you can. I know that there are people that are newly saved that use new versions out of ignorance, but the Holy Spirit of truth will guide them into all truth, according to Scripture. All right, They will eventually become King James Bible believing. That's just the way it's going to be. But if you have somebody that hates the King James Bible, that refuses to use it, they're not saved. Plain and simple. Heresy and apostasy is a strong word and wrong word to associate with genuine Christians who use other Bible translations. Well, that depends on how ignorant they are of it. If they know that it's wrong, then they are uh, heretics and apostates. Actually, they're not apostates because if you're lost, you can't be, you can't fall away from something that you were never in. I'm not afraid to use this uh, word, but I don't use it flippantly or ignorantly. Apostasy refers to ultimately disowning Christ and truth. 
and the Lord's ultimate rejection of those who merely professed Christ temporarily but had no saving relationship with him. Instead of identifying with Christ, the apostate finally and forever disassociates him with self with Christ and truth. Christians who use other Bible translations do not deny the great doctrines of the Bible and disown Christ. Actually, yes, they do. Many times I've seen that. There's a vast difference between being guilty of heresy and apostasy, as you state, and using another Bible translation that may stem from departed readings from the traditional text. Those who have historically departed from the traditional text, Origen, Eusebius, Griesbach, uh, Lachlan, that might be Lachman, I think is what he meant to say, Tregellus, and Tischendorf, etc., were apostate, many of them German rationalists. However, to label Christians as being guilty of actual apostasy when reading or using another Bible version is ill-advised. There is also a vast difference between being an apostate and associating with historic readings that have been altered or deleted because of apostasy. Granted, we would disassociate from the history of the critical text because of its association with apostasy based upon scripture, commands, and principles. However, we cannot conclude that those who use another Bible translation are actually guilty of apostasy themselves. <laughs> this guy should run for political office. You know, he'd be great. You seem to suggest that I am saying something that I never conveyed nor implied concerning my alleged promotion of the Nestle Alon Greek text and other Bible translations. I'm simply acknowledging that many Christians, not apostates, do use other Bible translation, translations who love the word and, yes, even the words without realizing some of the departures from the received text. They also love the Lord like we do. To place them in the realm of apostasy is not biblical, and in my opinion, it's ludicrous. Nevertheless, because of the history behind the modern translations, I do not personally promote them in my ministry outside the KJV, since the river of manuscripts stems from a corrupted line of manuscripts that delete or subtract many important words that are part of the commonly received text. Yes, inspiration is determined by manuscript evidence, as you suggest, and I am in full agreement with this. However, inspiration is not determined by the King James English, but the manuscripts behind the English, and as the words in English reflect the traditional or the received text tradition. Again, as it's accurately translated. See how they do it? If inspiration is determined by English, then the received text, which was printed in many different languages throughout the world, would not have been the word of oh, word of God or the words that God intended to give to many other people throughout the world. We need to think rationally on this matter. The Bible existed before 1611. People had the scriptures in 1610. Um, should we believe the Word of God existed in the received text in many different languages before 1611? Yes. Did we have any received text Bibles before 1611? Yes. Should we believe that the King James Version, English, is inspired over the Greek manuscripts? No. Should we believe that nobody can be a fundamentalist holding to the great fundamental doctrines of the Bible, even the doctrines of verbal inspiration and biblical and Bible separation, if they use another version of the Bible? No. Oh. So you can still be a fundamentalist and use a Bible version that subtracts and adds to God's Word. Forbidden in Scripture. But that's okay. You can still be a fundamentalist. Continuing. Historic fundamentalism used the King James Bible and fought the wars against liberalism. The King James Version has been historically associated with fundamentalism. And this is the re in this reason is reason enough not to change to another version. Of course, there are many other reasons not to change from the KJV to other versions. However, see see this flip-flopping? You come up to the truth and then you go back you back away from the truth. And you come up to the truth and you back away from the truth. It's not the Holy Spirit that does that, brethren. However, not everyone is an apostate, someone who has denied Christ in, or had denied Christ in the faith who uses another Bible translation. I might disagree with them on the matter of using another Bible translation and even their indirect association with apostasy through the historic inception of corruptions brought into the Greek text that depart from historic readings, but I'm not about to label them as an apostate. Again, it depends on their attitude. Do they knowingly attack the King James Bible? Are they knowingly using the new versions, understanding that they come from the corrupted source? While the King James Version was not directly given by the inspiration of God as the autograph, 2 Timothy 3.16, it is an accurate translation and reflection of what was given by the inspiration of God through God's superintendence and providence. The King James Bible is an accurate translation of the preserved text in relation to its words, whereas other versions clearly depart from the received text in many places. Therefore, it is a superior translation because of the manuscript evidence behind it and the words found in it. 
superior translation, but not perfect, you know. Again, you seem to be reading into this study by claiming that I take no stand against the other Bible translations. My purpose for this study was not to delve into all the issues related to the King James Version versus other Bible translations, but to remind all fundamentalists of their doctrinal heritage of supporting verbal inspiration, even though we might disagree with manuscripts. We take the position that God's Word was preserved in a majority received text manuscript tra tradition, which is va really the vast number of manuscripts, whereas others will take the minority of manuscript evidence position, even though they call it the multiplicity of manuscripts by tacking... Yep. by tacking on two other manuscripts, Vaticanus and Alexandrian, and following these readings over the majority of evidence. David Cloud, who was a staunch KJV man, <laughs> uh -huh, right. as you know, correctly observes, we also acknowledge the happy fact that there is a general overall doctrinal agreement between the textual families. This shows us two things. First, we can rejoice that God has overruled the wicked plan of men and devils and has maintained essential doctrine even in the most corrupted texts. So as long as the essentials are there, let's not fight over the words. What God says, you know, gives serious warnings about adding to or subtracting even one word. Well, that doesn't matter as long as the essentials are left there. You know, we'll come, you come home from work one day and your door's hanging open and you walk in and you realize that you've been robbed and you look and your family photo album is gone and you're money is gone that you had there and, and your wife's jewelry is gone and a bunch of other things and you call the police and the police get there and they walk through the house and they look around and they say, well, I don't see a problem. Say, what are you talking about? I was robbed. Yeah, but you still got the essentials. I mean, you got your stove, you got your toilet, you got electric lights, you know, you got your carpet. Hey, the essentials are here. What's the big deal? You say, well, that'd be insane. That'd be crazy. Oh, just about as insane as somebody saying, you know, as long as the essentials are still there in the new versions, it doesn't matter that they take out words and pervert scriptures and things, vital doctrine in the King James Bible, as long as the essential doctrines are there. David Cloud, staunch King James Version man. Yeah, staunch apostate. Ridiculous. Continuing. Second, this does not mean that the differences between the texts are insignificant and harmless. It does not mean that doctrine is unaffected. It also does not mean that it, it is not important to find and use the pure text. A swordsman of old did not think a dull sword and a sharp sword or a weak sword and a strong sword were the same. You can show someone the gospel of the grace of Christ even with a Roman Catholic version. You can prove the deity of Christ even with the perverted New World translation used by the Jehovah's Witnesses. You can teach the doctrine of the atonement even from a perversion such as today's as the today's English Bible, which deletes the word blood in most major passages. This shows the marvelous hand of God to confound the efforts of the devil, but not for a moment does this mean that the changes made in these and other new translations are not significant. This is political correctness. This is all this thing is. Wishy washy Leo to sin, neither hot nor cold. Just you know it's you know the new versions are wrong, but they're not really wrong. I mean, they, they take out words, but taking out the words is not as bad as not taking out words because taking out words of, of taking words out of taking words is not really taking the words out. You know what I mean? You know, <laughs> yeah, insanity. Let's continue. Any position that denies that there is no inspiration in other Bible translations is misleading. Oh, inspiration in other Bible translations. Any position that concludes that the English of the King James Bible corrects the Greek and takes precedence over the manuscript evidence is misleading. Any position that concludes other Christians who love the Lord and use other Bible translations are promoting heresy and are heretics is also misleading. Oh, okay, sure. Any position that concludes it's heretical to capitalize a word in our modern English when doing a research paper, which the King James translators chose to not capitalize in 1611, is also misleading, since they are also since they also choose to capitalize certain words from the lowercase Greek text. I agree with David Cloud. Congratulations there. Recognizing that not everything is wrong in other Bible translations, this does not mean I give my consent and approval of other Bible translations, allow them to be used in my church, or have any respect for them. I respect the King James Bible for its accuracy 
It's received text-based and, and out of respect for God's preserved word. I do not use other Bible translations. So, again, one more little page here of stupid nonsense. But, again, you see this thing of the modern-day hireling. They will tell people what they want to hear to get their money. And I bring that up in my next letter. And he enjoys it, you know, in his follow-up letter. But the fact of the matter is, they will never condemn something as outright satanic. Because they don't really believe in Satan. You know, that just Satan is just kind of a, uh, you know, kind of a Bible character. You know, he doesn't do things satanic. There's no satanic conspiracies anywhere. It's just, you know, I don't, I don't personally recommend television. But I don't totally condemn it either. You know. I personally don't look at pornography, but there are other people that do, and I personally am not going to condemn those people. And, you know, I, don't, I personally don't snort cocaine, but if you do, I mean, as long as you're doing it and you love the Lord, I can't condemn you as a lost person. No standards at all. You know why? No backbone. No guts. He's worried about his reputation and his uh, income. Last page, I reiterate, I reiterate, reiterate, I'll get it out yet, what I said in the booklet. Yes, there are differences between the text types that we must address in the preservation manuscript translation debate, and after knowing the differences, take our stand. And yes, there will be some fire and smoke that arises from the debate. So be it. But let's possess a, a good disposition in the debate and stop calling follow, fellow fundamentalists, heretics, and apostates. This is not, as you say, standing for inspiration of translation while taking no stand for any specific translation. However, my purpose, and yes it is, by the way, however, my purpose for writing the booklet was to confirm the stand of fundamentalism as it relates to verbal inspiration and preservation. Some fundamentalists may not be in my camp, but this does not make them less fundamental in their positional statements and embrace verbal inspiration. In aspects related to ecclesiastical and personal separation and the historic doctrines of the Bible, most of them don't espouse the notion that there is apostasy associated with the critical text position. I would disagree with them wholeheartedly, but I would not disavow them as fundamentalists. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, you close your letter by saying that there are many other issues which I believe are very misleading in this booklet. I have absolutely no problem with people critiquing, critiquing my writings, but I'm amazed that you find so many issues when I'm defending verbal plenary inspiration in relation to God's preserved word and words without conceding to the Westcott and Hort theory. But he does. Uh, again, this booklet was written to defend historic fundamentalism and its stand up upon the verbal and plenary inspiration of Scripture, both in the autographs and preservation of the autographs, as they are re reflected in the Bibles we have today. Respectfully, I might f find some of your obscurantist and overcritical views to be misleading when they are weighed and found wanting in light of the historical facts and rules of both English and Greek grammar. But actually, when it's all said and done, we support the same Bible, the same Greek text, for the same reasons, and believe in verbal preservation. Brother, that is good enough for me. Sincerely, Pastor Lying Serpent. Okay. So two more letters to read here, and then we'll be done with nutty nonsense here. And it gets real good. I know you've been with me for a while now, and you're probably, like, getting a little bit weary of this, but... Uh, now is when the fun begins. So, here we go. My reply back. Pastor, Clar pa Pastor, Claria. Pastor Kelly, thank you for clarifying the points that I raised in my initial letter to you. Your stand for the King James Bible is exactly why the body of Christ is in so much trouble today. Let me briefly explain. Your first paragraph states that fundamentalists have always believed in verbal inspiration and that the Bible they have used uh, was also verbally inspired. So in other words, it is not a particular version, but rather simply being a fundamentalist. And please don't insult my intelligence by trying to claim support solely for the KJV because your letter made it crystal clear that you believe God had a hand in even the horribly corrupt new versions, which we just read. As long as some words and phrases are accurately translated, then the version contains part of God's inspired words. Never mind the multiple warnings in Scripture over changing even one word. And I give the Scriptures. A man can use a new version from the Vatican and still be sound in the faith as long as he is a fundamentalist. Concerning the capitalization of the W in word when referring to the written word, 
I brought this point up because I'm used to seeing lost liberals using the same trick to deceive their readers into thinking they are taking stands for the perfect written word when they are not. I personally take names and titles for the Lord Jesus Christ very seriously and would never substitute one of his names for written scripture. Minuscule Greek readings? I thought your booklet was about English scriptures. Why bring up the word conspiracy? I find this to be one of the most pathetic of all tactics used by modern preachers. You ought to be ashamed of yourself for even implying that there are no conspiracies connected with the Bible version issue. The Jesuit order is now openly working on new version translation committees, the Common English Bible, um, and Roman Catholic websites now promote and even sell supposed Protestant Bible versions. There most definitely is a conspiracy to bring all professing Christians back under the control of Rome through the leaven of the new versions. If you deny this fact, then you are either so ignorant that you shouldn't be in ministry, or you are part of the conspiracy itself. I'll let you make up your mind which one of those two it is. Your letter reminds me of the slick words of a politician. You write in a way that pleases both sides and leaves authority up to personal preference. To you, the new versions are not satanic, just written in a way that you wouldn't personally recommend or prefer. But if others want to use them, that is fine. No judging here, just love and tolerance among fundamentalists. On page 6, you quote David Cloud saying, We can rejoice that God has overruled the wicked plan of men and devils and has maintained essential doctrine even in the most corrupted texts. Why not believe the truth that it was Satan who left some doctrines intact but intentionally changed other vital doctrines and scriptures to purposefully deceive people? Isn't this what he did to Eve in the Garden of Eden? The analogy of rat poison being mostly good food with just enough poison to kill you also lines up with Paul's warning of a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump in Galatians 5.9 and 1 Corinthians 5.6. And why do the new versions continually get worse and worse if there is no satanic conspiracy behind them? I do have sympathy for Christians who use the new versions out of ignorance. The Lord has enabled me to reach many thousands of them. I don't judge them or label them as heretics or apostates. My issue is with those who know about the the obvious corruptions in the new versions, and yet persist in using and promoting them along with attacking the KJV. I have no time for people like this, and I will openly rebuke them and call them out for their support of the satanic new versions which stem from the Roman Catholic system. I have no desire to be lukewarm like you, Revelation 3, 15 through 16. I believe in calling sin, sin, and knowingly, use, uh, and knowingly using a new version is a very serious sin. Continuing, John 16, 13 says that the spirit of truth will guide you into all truth, and John 17, 17 defines truth as the written words of God. I believe it is impossible for a truly saved man or woman to hate and despise the King James Bible. And yet this is exactly what I see from many leading fundamentalist new version promoters like James White. But I guess I shouldn't judge him for despising and mocking the KJV as long as he holds to the fundamentals. How is this standard to be considered orthodox? Uh, for Bible-believing Christians. In conclusion, I will say that as a former New Version user for 25 years of my life, I can tell you that it is impossible to be right with God while using a version that is based on the Alexandrian text and the philosophies of the Catholic Westcott and Hort camp. The New Versions are from Satan. They attack Jesus Christ and vital doctrines of the faith, often with zero manuscript support from either side. There most definitely is a conspiracy concerning the counterfeiting of Scripture, and there always has been. Ever heard of Yea hath God said? I am well aware of all the little word games and semantics which are played in the whole realm of the Bible version debate. I have studied this issue for a very long time. Most of it is simply a waste of time in the realm of men like yourself who are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Timothy 3 7. A true belief in the KJV as the absolute standard of truth for the English speaking world would mean that all other English versions are counterfeits and therefore a sin to use. You would turn in, in a criminal for using a counterfeit $20 bill, but it is okay for someone to use a counterfeit Bible. Your booklet is misleading and offers no condemnation to those who promote and defend the new versions. You provide the loophole for those who refuse to give up their satanic new versions. They can be right with God simply by holding to fundamentals, while rejecting the only English Bible that, God, that has God's approval upon it. But I guess taking stands like a true Bible believer might get you classified as obscured, obscurantist and overcritical, and of course that would affect your image and income as well. I am sure it would be a nightmare for you to be classified as a Ruckmanite 
and ostracized by your academic peers for standing too strongly for the KJV. Then I quote Mark 838 in Christ Jesus. Again, I didn't sign my name because this is just a copy. And now the final correspondence written back 25th of April, 2015. Okay. Again, seven pages here, front and back. Uh, here we go. All right. Greetings, Brian. Sorry I spelled your name wrong last letter. Just a few thoughts from your recent letter that you sent. I suppose there's really no reason to keep responding back and forth at this point. I'm likely getting the last word, but I felt it was necessary because of your gross misrepresentations of my position in the last letter when you went on some rabbit trails regarding various issues which have nothing to do with me. Everything had to do with him. I got him, and he doesn't like it. You probably did not read my study on the KJV, which can be found on the church website, and you did... And if you did, you obviously were wearing a blindfold. I hotly debate and contest the modern versions, tracing their origin and corruptions, and ex explicitly declare where they are corrupt. I've taken time with people to teach the errors of these corrupt Bibles for over 30 years of my preaching and teaching ministry. Okay? And, you know, I know about his stands. But then why, if you take such quote-unquote strong stands for the King James Bible, why write a new or little tract thing, a little booklet here, that says it doesn't matter what Bible version you use? See, the double standard. Now watch what he does here. Watch this little insult at me. You know, This is the thing that a lot of these self-righteous hirelings will do. They are high and mighty. They have never sinned. They've never done anything wrong. They're not little wicked sinners like you know I once was before I got saved. And I'm still a sinner saved by grace. That's the difference now. But you know, uh, they're just so holy. They just kind of levitate above the ground as they walk. You know, They'd never be a dirty old sinner like I was. Now look at this. I'm thankful I was not deceived by the other versions for 25 years, like I was, you know. I'm not chiding you for sharing this with me, but just making a point. <laughs> yes, you are, you <laughs> stinging liar. I saw the light long before you ever did, and my track record cannot be overturned by your superficial and unwarranted statements. To conclude that I don't support the KJV above the other versions is insulting to say the least. Not that I hold any grudge against you for saying it, just expressing my thoughts. Again, the, the political doublespeak. The KJV is more than just a preference for me, as you intimate in your letter. I support it for the accuracy of its preserved words. Remember this, okay? Remember what he just said right there. I support it for the accuracy of its preserved words. Remember that. Because it, later on in this very letter, he denies the King James Bible's perfection. He says it should be translated better. Your conclusions regarding my alleged weak position on the KJV are enormously misleading. I'm amazed at your glaring inconsistencies to accept facts that I presented in the last letter. These are not facts designed to lead people away from the KJV, but to be honest with the historic received text that God has preserved, which the KJV was built upon, and mostly all Bibles that preceded it, even those in 1610. Oh, you mean like the Jesuit, you know, Dewey Reams? Oh, he would never refer to a thing like that. Thou shalt not bear false witness, Romans 13, 9, which, as you know, is missing from the modern versions. You have borne false witness in many ways in your last letter with all of your ranting and raving and failure to deal with facts. Okay, I dealt with all the facts. Thank you very much. False witness number one, your claim that my letter made it crystal clear that I believe God had a hand in the corrupt Bible versions. Where did I say this or even imply this? Yes, there is received text tradition in the modern versions. Fact. But I never said that I support the modern versions because of this. The deletions and departures from the historic received text are enormous and out of a deep reverence and respect for the God's eternal word and words, I don't encourage or even imply that others can use other versions. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Right there. I don't imply that others can use other versions. Right there. He says it. We might disagree on some of the particulars about manuscript evidence and even on Bible translations. See, he's a liar. The guy's a total liar. Uh, 
I don't encourage or even imply that others can use other versions. I just showed you that he just lied. Nobody has called me up since I wrote this booklet and said, thanks for softening your stand on the KJV and receive text and coming over to the other side. I gave them no ground or reason to do this by what I wrote. Yes, he did. False witness number two. You insinuate that I don't take the personal titles of Jesus Christ seriously. Really? Most new evangelicals take Jesus Christ and his titles seriously, and if they don't, they are not evangelical. I am a fundamentalist and certainly take the titles and names of Jesus Christ seriously. I simply clarified a fact about the minuscule Greek readings, the lowercase readings, which you seem to brush off as insignificant in order to make the point that the King James translators did capitalize certain words for significance. The capital was never in the Greek manuscripts. I'm certainly not against capitalizing the name for Christ. I'm glad they did, but neither am I belittling Christ's name in the scriptures as the word for capitalizing the phrase, the word of God, in my writing. This is such an absurdity that I won't make any further comment on it. Uh-huh, <laughs> right. You don't know the history of fundamentalism. Uh, yes, I do. The godly men of the past who fought the historic wars against liberalism uh, have all stood for the inspiration of scripture. This is why they were fighting against the liberals. To say they did not believe in inspiration is to ignore history. It's like saying this country was founded without any Christian principles. Again, we won't get into that. But again, this was the entire reason for writing this booklet. Fundamentalism has always historically stood for the inspiration of Scripture. Alleged fundamentalists have weakened their position on the inspiration of Scripture in their mad attempts to support the critical text position. I give illustrations of this in my 158-page study on the KJV. Believe me, I've read all the rhetoric, probably more than uh, you have read over the years, no pride there. I know all the bells and whistles that are played to downplay the received text in KJV, and I vehemently oppose it. My studies and teaching over the years would all back this up. See, before I continue, let me just explain something. Every scholar out there, if you push them hard enough, they'll start to throw their education in your face. I am more educated than you. I have done more, and I have been used more, and I... You know, kind of funny because you know who was it that said i will be i am i will be like the most high you know interesting isaiah chapter 14 if you don't know false witness number three you make the remark that i don't think there are any conspiracies related to the creation of the modern versions this too is rubbish i said there is no conspiracy conspiracy in capitalizing the word of god in the normal english when writing a document I also said there is not a hidden conspiracy going on behind every independent fundamental King James Version or Bible church. That's because it does not accept your intolerant and ignorant position that the King James English corrects the Greek. When did I ever say that? I never said that. I never made that statement. I never said nor insinuated that there was no conspiracy related to the modern versions. But it's implied. Obviously it's implied. And again, I knew the guy. I mean, you know, I went and showed him some conspiracy type of stuff, New World Order things, and he just laughed about it. I love this little thing here. Watch this. Number four, false witness. You make the claim that I'm a, like a slick politician. Let's say Hillary Clinton. And well, you know, you know, he both he has a woman's name, so I guess maybe he fits in there. But uh, and speak out of both sides of my mouth in order to please both sides. This too is a falsity. No, it isn't. I proved it. Anyone who knows and studies what I've written and preached over the years would never come to this conclusion. I never gave in to the other side for the sake of love and tolerance while writing this particular study. And yes, he did. <laughs> in this booklet, I simply clarify the fundamentalist position on inspiration in the midst of a sea of confusion and compromise. I make no inference, inference in my study that I have taken the other side. Yes, there are differences between the text types and that we must address in the preservation manuscript translation debate. And after knowing that differences take our stand. And yes, there will be some fire and smoke that arises from the debate. So be it. I'm not a doubting Thomas in regard to the received uh, majority text in spite of what you say or think. Yes, you are. False witness number five. You insinuate that I am part of the crowd that know about the obvious corruption in, corruptions in the new versions, but do not openly expose those errors and send warning to others about them. Therefore, I am lukewarm. Uh, no, as I've mentioned, I hotly debate with those who want to promote the modern versions like James White. I ex excessively quote the errors of James White in my large study on the KJV. I disagree wholeheartedly with his conclusions about the received text and textual preservation. I am not a silent fundamentalist. False witness number six, you falsely claim that I am practicing little word games and semantics. He is, while speaking about the version debate. Actually, I wasn't speaking about the versions in this study at all. Uh, yes, you were. I mean, he, he openly says American Standard Version or other Bible translations, you know, 
other Bible versions. But he's not speaking about other versions. Uh, yeah. This was not my purpose for writing it. I have other studies dealing with this issue. Furthermore, I do not... Or I do know all the arguments that the other side gives for supporting the modern versions and minority text. I have all the books and I've read their arguments. Congratulations, Princess. Uh, I know what they are saying. Disagree with them, expose them, and fight against them. Let me just move this letter stuff out of the way there. False witness number seven. You place me in the same realm of men who are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. My first thought would be, if the shoe fits, wear it. Well, I guess he is wearing it then. Since you are not writing to acknowledge the truth about the received Greek text tradition that was passed down through the church centuries, there were pure Bibles before 1611, and that there are certain words in our King James Bible, now look at this, which can be better translated to more accurately reflect the original Greek language. Actually, this verse, 2 Timothy 3, 7, has nothing to do with Christians, but true apostates who come into the church which reject the precious truths of God's word. None of us would fit into this category. So it is an improper association and application to my life and ministry. Certain words in our King James Bible, which can be better translated. Need I say any more? I have been very open to critique and have learned from very godly and learned men down through the years, implying that I'm not, but I'm amazed that you could call me ignorant without seeing the plank in your own eye by failing to recognize the received text tradition which was passed down to us in the tra translation of the KJV. No, I'm not ignorant about the history of the received text or the perversions in the modern versions. However, I might come to this conclusion regarding your position, but if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. So I'm ignorant. You know... <laughs> Yes, I believe God's word is in English. As your website says, the King James Version is God's perfect word in English. However, you cannot have perfect English without a perfect Greek text that is reflected in the English. This is why there is need to sometimes correct or even update an English word. Show to show. While preaching and teaching as you expound and explain the Bible to people, this is not the same thing as casting doubt on historic readings, texts, and phrases in the Bible or correcting... Uh, what the Bible says, but occasionally clarifying certain words which stem from the Greek text. Oh, yes, of course. Now, look at this. Here we go. Now, remember, he holds to the King James Bible, and the King James Bible is God's inspired word. Now, watch what he does. For instance, devils is literally translated demons. Not true. Since there is only one devil, there, this is a more accurate translation. No, it's not. The Greek word there, demon or daimonion or something like this, it you know it's not an accurate translation. It's a transliteration to bring the thing from Greek demon into English demon. It's not an accurate translation. Devils is far more accurate. It's a much better translation. Okay. The word conversation, an older English word, means much more than just talking. It speaks of the whole manner of one's life. Now look at this one. The word Easter, Acts 12, 4, means Passover. Oh, you miserable liar, you. The word atonement can be better understood as reconciliation. Atonement was an Old Testament concept connected with animal sacrifice. No, duh. And the word whales, whales actually means a huge fish, a large aquatic animal. The term ghost is spirit as translated elsewhere. But he believes the King James Bible. You see? You see, you push these devil, these, these Satanists like this, devil worshipers. I'll say it. You push them hard enough and it comes out. The truth comes out. He doesn't believe this King James Bible for one minute. Not one minute. He earns his living from it. He is a hireling. That's all he is. And when you meet with these men in private, this is what comes out of their mouths. They don't believe this book for one minute. And when you say, hey, you're, a, you're an apostate, you're a liar, they'll start putting you down like he's doing to me. And, you know, it, this doesn't even affect me. You know, we, my wife and I read this letter and we laughed. You know, like reading the Sunday comics or something. But uh, let's continue. In spite of your dogged insistence that this practice changes God's inerrant, inspired, and infallible words, someday you will know, if not in this life, uh, the next, 
that this is exactly what the received text says. This is not a hit on the KJV or on the Greek text where a person tries to change the actual words found in the received text or replace phrases and entire sections found in the King James Bible. It's simply being honest with the Greek language and declaring God's word from the base of the historically accepted Greek text upon which the KJV was established. False witness number eight. You continue to insist that my booklet is misleading, offering no condemnation to those who use other versions, and that I make a loophole for others to continue to use other versions. Actually, my intent for writing was to talk about fundamentalism and inspiration and not the whole version debate. I could listen to a lot of your message on the internet or things that you might have written and come to the same false conclusion about you. Doubt it. This is because there are times we speak and write to drive home a certain point without becoming sidetracked by too many other teachings or issues. We want to keep the main point the main point. So your comment is once again, weighed and found wanting. Oh boy. I'm just, I'm awed to be in the presence of such intellect. I mean, this guy is just so far above me. I mean, yeah. False witness number nine. You make the bold claim and assertion that I'm fearful of being labeled as an obs uh, obscurantist and overcritical preacher within the ranks of my academic peers. Actually, I address this phrase to you because of your strange position on the KJV English language and your ignorance of never reverting to the Greek language for clarification of some English words. Why do I need to do that? I have a perfect English translation. Why do I need to go waste time with Greek? Um, and for the record, I've been called many things over the years for taking a stand on the KJV, a legalist, bigot, unloving, etc. But don't worry, I can stand the heat even from the academia world of today who oppose the received text. Doubtful, very doubtful. I will be honest with you. I do have those who are much more knowledgeable in academics and the languages that I have followed in the past and present. I look up to them and deeply respect them for their stand on the received text. How about Dean Bergen? You can't get more academic credentials than this. However, if you want to be a Ruckmanite, as you suggest, then so be it. Peter Ruckman says over and over in his book, Handbook of Manuscript Evidence, that the KJV is superior to the original Greek. And it is. It absolutely is. Okay, you say, well, how could that be? Well, first of all, when Ruckman is saying about the original Greek, he's talking about the original autographs. Okay, but secondly, there are many places where even the Receptus, the Textus Receptus, who transmitted the text down through the years? The Greek Orthodox Church. See, the King James Bible, and so can you really call it, the, can we really, excuse me, trust the Greek Orthodox Church to accurately and, and make sure that they preserved it perfectly. Well, there's debate there. See, the King James Bible is not 100% pure Textus Receptus. There were older translations that are go back even older than a lot of the manuscripts, the Greek manuscripts. The King James Bible was a, is a, the most unique translation that's ever been done because it's primarily Receptus, but it also relies on other ancient uh, translations. So again, they, they obscure what I believe, what Ruckman has taught, what Sam Gipp teaches, what, what a lot of men of God teach, all to skirt the issue of having a perfect translation. This is, not, this is what they don't want to deal with. See, they need to keep themselves up on a platform where they can go back to the Greek and the Hebrew and put down the laity. They don't like laity having the sword of the Spirit in their hands. They don't like that. They can be judged by this book. So you have to keep a loophole there that says, well, you know, actually the word should be better translated or, or maybe we could look at another, you know, see, that's the issue here. Continuing, he says where the Greek says one thing and the authorized version says another, throw out the Greek. I would rather be labeled a received textite because this is the same text Christians have followed down through the centuries of church history. Again, he's slanting this whole issue. We're not going to get into all that. Do you realize that the vast majority of KGV and received text supporters do not espouse the unlearned position of Peter Ruckman. <laughs> Little games that these guys play. Uh, this is because it simply is not true and you must put blindfolds on to take this errant position. Of course, acceptance from the vast majority does not make something right. Uh, however, many who teach, preach, defend, and proclaim God's word in the English language, the KGV will not, you know, God's word in the English language, wait a second, you just corrected it earlier will not buy into the position of correcting the Greek with the English, English language. If all the smoke and debris that you created ever clears, <laughs> you'll, see, <laughs> yeah, 
You will see that we both follow the KJV Bible because of the historic church or received text. I simply do not place the English above the Greek and have never assigned the theory that the KJV translators were inspired like the apostles who wrote the scripture. The KJV translators never made this claim. This would be heretical, and as I've mentioned, there are many KJV supporters who would agree wholeheartedly with this, and they don't accept the modern version readings by simply acknowledging this fact. They dogmatically reject them. Just stop there for a minute. Is the KJV superior to the Greek? Well, let me just show you something here quickly. Uh... See if I can figure this stupid thing out. Let's do a little quick comparison. All right. Now here you have Matthew chapter 1, 1, King James Bible, Matthew chapter 1, 1, with the uh, Textus Receptus. Now, how many of you can read this? How many of you can read that? Is this superior to this? No. You out on the street and witness to people. You going to take this? Let me show you how to be saved, friend. Let me just show you here the promises of Scripture. Let me show you that. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful, what the Lord's written to you there? You know what this is? This is worthless to a modern Christian today. This book here is priceless. Why on earth are you going to waste your time over here? The work's already been done. You see what I mean? You know, I read about this whole thing and studied this whole issue and stuff years and years ago, and I came to the understanding that if I was prideful, I would go and I'd try to learn all the Greek and the Hebrew so I could debate and all that other stuff and prove that I'm above the average Christian. Or I could just read and believe what God gave me here in the King James Bible. And I'd go out there and I could show other people and say, look at this, this is what God says. Right there, read this. Look in here. See? God isn't going to use you when you have to continually question his words like this lying devil just did. Oh, Easter is a mistranslation, just like the New Versionists say. And the other things that he said too. He doesn't believe the King James Bible for one minute. Number 10, false witness. Not much more to go here. Twice in your letter you comment that it is impossible to have fellowship with God and be right with God if you use another Bible version. I find this rather alarming. Were you out of fellowship with God for 25 years when you used other Bible versions? Yes, I was lost. I was totally out of fellowship with God. I was a porn addict. I was, I was wicked. I listened to heavy metal. I was, I was a very, very uh, wicked individual. You know, church going, of course. You know, yes, you are out of fellowship if you're using a new version. Didn't God hear your prayers? No, he didn't. I was lost. Were you overcome by the devil and were you never used by God or used of God? Yeah, absolutely. I was, I was overcome by the devil and I was not used by God. Was God ignoring you? Yes. Did God snub you off as being in insignificant and unusable? Yes, I was lost. It's an absurdity to come to these conclusions. No, it isn't. It's the truth. Remember, you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ someday, along with all those other saints that you seem to label as heretics out of fellowship with God and your enemies simply because they use another Bible version. Uh, well, like I said, are they using them ignorantly or are they using them knowingly? If they're using them knowingly, then they're not going to be standing at the judgment seat of Christ. They'll be standing at the great white throne judgment. Okay, do we agree with them? No. Does this mean they themselves can't have fellowship with God and be blessed by God in their Christian life? No. See the political thing here. It's just, it's insane. Everyone as a Christian is at different levels in their spiritual lives and their journey may eventually lead them to a place where they better understand about the Bible or about the version issue. However, this does not make them a second rate Christian. Sure. 
You can be led by a spirit of error, but you're not a second-rate Christian. And we're all on different, different levels of, you know, in our spiritual walk. Got to love that too. Brian, when you stand before the Lord, you might be ashamed, as you mentioned in Mark 8.38, for some of the things you have done and are doing today and the unfair and radical conclusions you have said and made about others and the church today. Just maybe? Uh, no, God has not called us to be a silent fundamentalist, but neither has he called us to make untrue statements about other believers who truly do love the Lord and have a close walk and relationship with him, which Kelly Sensnick does not have. Well enough has, has been said to clarify, clarify my position, and whether you believe it or not really makes no difference to me. God is my witness and judge. Yes, he certainly is. I just don't understand why you would shoot someone who is on the same side. You're not on the same side as me, Kelly Sensnig. P.S. I don't worry about my image and income, as you suggest, since God takes care of, of this or of that as I faithfully do what is right, seek to live a testimony for God's glory, and preach his word faithfully. Gotta love his little final jab at me there. As ever in him. Smelly Sensnig. So there you have it. Huh, been a long study, but I want to get through that thing and just show you that is how it's done. This is how the lying apostate that does not believe in the King James Bible, I shouldn't even call him an apostate, you know, the lying heretic of uh, that does not believe in the Bible that they hold in their hands. And these guys will start their little Babel building. They will bring in, and, and how he runs things, he does all this old-fashioned preaching, an old King James Bible, and old. And what he does is he suckers in elderly people. Uh, that's how he suckered in my parents. Uh, we'll bring it back to the glory days, just like it was when you were a child, you know. And uh, we'll sing the old hymns, and we'll dress in our Sunday best, and we'll do things the old-fashioned way so that when you die, we can eventually get your money and things like this. And, of course, we'll get your tithe out of you and all that. Uh, that's, that's what it is. It's a business. Um, and he says, I stand for the King James Bible. But right there in the letter, he openly, clearly stated that it should be translated differently in numerous places. And I'm sure if you actually sat down with him and said, where all should the King James Bible be translated differently, he'd give you a list that's a mile long. Uh, when I knew him, when I was going to that cult there, that cult building, he had over 60,000 books in his collection. That's why he is ever learning and never, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I'll be quite frank with you. A lot of these books that you see behind you here are not about biblical type subjects. Uh, I read and study a lot of different subjects, uh, a lot of them just for practical living. Okay, As a wood turning artist, a lot of this stuff down here on the lower shelf is about wood turning. Uh, I'm interested in other things like that. Um, most of my study is right here. Uh, when I prepare sermons, I, it's it's myself and the Lord. I'll look up stuff online. I might refer to some of my books up here. I might eventually, you know, occasionally check a commentary here from Dr. Ruckman because I know Dr. Ruckman's not going to say go back to the Greek or the, the Hebrew or whatever and correct the English. He doesn't correct the English with the Greek and the Hebrew like Kelly Sensnick does, you know. But most of those, I've never even looked at them, you know. Uh, it's just, it's absurd, this whole thing. And I wanted to put this thing together mostly for the young Christians that are out there that will get ensnared by liars like that. And again, you know, we, you know, he stands for the King James Bible and he's not been deceived, you know, like I've been deceived as a lost man. He rubs that in my face. I find that interesting. And yet the guy has a Babel building without any scriptural support. A battle building that's based on a Greek Parthenon with a phallic uh, steeple on the top of it and all the spirits that go along with that thing. You know, they're making merchandise of people is all that they're doing. Bringing the old people, give them what they want, make the money off of it. You know, and of course he's a, I remember too, you know, he's like Republican, 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 you know. And uh, he thought I was a Democrat because I was against George W. Bush because George W. Bush is a member of Skull and Bones, you know. So I'm a Democrat because I'm against a Republican. <laughs> you know? No, I'm against all politicians, you know, in the highest levels of government. They're all crooked. They're all corrupt. They're all bought out by the corporations. Bought and paid for, I should say, by the corporations. And in fact, many of them are in the corporations, and that's how they get into office. You know, they're, they're invested, so heavily invested in all these different companies and things. Another issue. But this is what you're dealing with. Now, people, you know, have gotten excited, you know, and stuff because I'll say, if you're in a church like this, you need to leave it, you know. 
as a whole. That's it sounds bad to withdraw, you know, fellowship from these people. Hey, listen. Your standard, if you ever want to be used of God, your standard has to be here. Not here. Definitely not there. You know, your standard has to be the Word of God. You have to make up your mind. You say, well, Brian, I don't believe the King James Bible is perfect. Okay, then don't be a hypocrite. Go out, take your Texas Receptus and your Hebrew Masoretic text, and you go out and you preach to people, preach to the lost out of this book. Get on YouTube, get on the internet, do some kind of a ministry out there, and you preach word for word from here. The perfect, inspired, and errant, original, autograph, whatevers. Do that. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't stand up there and use a Bible and call it inspired when you don't believe it. That is my main point that I try to get through to people. I call this God's Word because I believe it's perfect. And you will never once see me say, it should be better translated as. It's not going to happen. That to me is blasphemy. Saying, it's God's Word, but it should be corrected. So that will be it for this study. Uh, very detailed. Got into a lot of things here and, you know, a uh, lot to say. But that's the kind of stuff that you're going to run into. Um, be very careful about people that profess to be King James only. Be very careful about that. So that's going to be it. I'm uh, going to be getting into some more Bible studies in the future here. Uh, a lot of very interesting subjects we're going to be coming out with. Um, and I'm going to be using the King James Bible. I'm not going to mess around with Greek. So that will be it. Thank you very much for watching.